what got me when I moved over here. They've got some of the most dangerous animals in the world. Some that are, you know, swim in the sea. You've got these sharks, the jellyfish. Then you've got the snakes, the spiders that dig holes in the ground. You've got anything. And what gets me is everyone walks around with flip-flops and goes swimming. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Game Over Man. My name is Loz, and with me today I've got two gentlemen from Deeper Magic Studios. I've got Jonathan and Chad. How are you doing, gents? Good, uh, good to meet you. Thanks, Ben. Now, these two gentlemen are working on a game called Albatross. Now, gentlemen, before we get started on what Albatross is and all that sort of stuff, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'll start with you, Jonathan. What got you into the industry, and really, what brought you to Albatross? Yeah, well, so my background has been uh, film and television developments with uh, the Hollywood studio system. So... I live in New York City, been based out of here for uh, nearly a decade now. And, you know, it, it's the secret of Hollywood that you can essentially make a pretty good living without actually having much of your material see the light of day. And so, you know, I, I love what I do. I love it. I love it to death. I love everyone I work with. But it, it does become a bit of an exercise in frustration at points where you just, you have all these brilliant ideas. Well, I mean, we think we're, you know, some of them are brilliant anyway, and then no one else hears about it. So the idea of a game, it's something I sort of tooled around with back in uh, college at university, and Chad and I linked up. He had a bit of a genius idea, and he, he wanted me along for the ride, and so we're, uh, what is it, Chad, now three years we've been doing this? Uh, it's coming up on two years, I think. So what about you, Chad? Well, how did you get into the industry then, Mike? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm in the industry yet. <laughs> I am, uh, so let's we'll see. How far back do I go? I'm an interaction designer. I work on a uh, Microsoft product. It's actually Skype right now. And before that, I was in sort of children's animation. So I worked on cartoons, uh, animated characters, building 3D environments for sets. And so I have sort of a diverse background in art, and I dabble a lot in, in code. And so I, I've always been interested in games and entertainment. John and I worked on little, you know, campy films in college together. We're college buddies. And I'd been wanting to make a game for a little while, and so I had this idea around this time travel game. So it gave John up a call, because uh, John's incredibly persistent, and I knew he'd help me finish. <laughs> and Because uh, I'm I, historically, I've not been a great finisher of projects. Uh, no, so, Chad, you harden yourself, but it's absolutely true. Chad's, Chad's a genius, but <laughs> but he, he will hop from idea to idea, so it is, you know, it's something you grow into, I think. He's there. He's there now. It's great. Yeah. So I did I did a couple software projects before this. We did, I did a little startup on my own for a while, and so I got I got conditioned into finishing things and finally decided that I could give John a call and maybe he'd respect me again. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's 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 where we are now. Um, that's that's how we got into the to the game world. Right. So I mean, looking at albatrossgame.com, your your own website, you don't give much away. <laughs> All I can see is, well, as you called it, a cinematic cerebral side scroller. What does that mean? Please enlighten me. Yes, it's funny because it, I, I sort of feel like game genres. I mean, you know, the broad strokes ones are pretty set in stone. It seems like you know, platformers a thing that everyone sort of gets, but. It seems like, you know, as the industry develops and evolves, it just gets more and more niche. And, and you just have, like, these great terms that are, you know, like, cinematic. That's that's this new tag that a lot of games are getting. And um, we wanted to try to encompass everything everything we're doing. You know, it's a puzzle game, and it's in it's in 2D or 2.5D, simply because we attempted to do it in, in 3D, first-person 3D at first. And, and Chad developed this, uh, this prototype, and it was simply... It, it was too much for the brain to comfortably handle, honestly. So we, we sort of squashed it into into a, a flatter experience that would make the puzzles something that... We don't, we don't want everything about it to be impossible. But yeah, it's a cinematic cerebral side-scroller about time travel, causation, and death. Lots and lots of death. Yeah, I've read that tagline. So is that because the game is very, very hard and you will die a lot? Or <laughs> is the game based around death? We, we've been struggling with that tagline a little bit. It's definitely the, the narrative is very much about death and you will die a lot but it's not like a die a lot, die a lot like a super meat boy kind of death or even like a a, a limbo kind of death but it'll be certainly going to be challenging i would say the puzzles are going to be a little more cerebral though so you're going to spend a little more time on the logic of it rather than pure action and being shredded by spikes constantly yeah and it's also not a rope like you know it's not it's not something that's impossible and and, and then you're you're resetting to the beginning every time you you fail at it you know it's just 
na- narratively is is principally where that that plays in. It is our goal is it'll be extremely challenging. What sort of storyline have you got involved in this? I mean, you've you've obviously got a character on your on your website with the glasses. Has he at least got a name? Like, what's his deal? Yes. So his name is Stuart. He's the character that's the the protagonist. You're playing as him. He he sort of stumbles into this world of albatross and stumbles into these puzzles. And our you know really our goal our goal with with his character was to um you know I see a lot of games uh, especially you know and it's fair to say that for independent developers you just don't have the resources or necessarily as many different degrees of training and all the different. You know, like uh, being able to, to to write and draw and, and code and design, like all these elements have to come together so completely to make it just feel like a prog- product that has what, what I would say is, you know, storytelling and design and, and, and sort of puzzle integrity. But our goal with this was to have have a story that gripped you and was honestly, I'm hoping, sort of the level of like a TV show, something that like is really, really solid narratively, but isn't arbitrary. You know, it's connected deeply with like what's going on with the puzzle mechanic that, uh, that Chad invented. Yeah, so the idea of the uh, of Stuart is that he's he's stumbling into this place and there's these puzzles, but it's not all just arbitrary. There's sort of something going on and 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 someone sort of uh, someone or something sort of directing him uh, as he proceeds through this through this albatross, which I should specify as a place. Albatross is a place. You've you've got me hooked. I'm dying to know what's going on. <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned you've got a lot about time travel. Did you find yourself getting stuck in that when you're trying to do something in the time travel side doesn't work, you get in that sort of loop, like if the Terminator, there's a couple of plot holes in Terminator because of time travel and that sort of stuff. Have you studied every sort of aspect? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, it's kind of fun because it was a very challenging bit of gameplay design. You know, typically what you're going to do with these with these uh, platformers that are sort of puzzle-oriented is you're going to introduce a mechanic and then layer on with more mechanics, and then you're going to add more platforms platform types and keep mixing it up by sort of adding layers of complexity with different interacting elements. Uh, you know, like you have to press that lever to open that door and that door leads you to this room that gives you the button to open the next room. So there's the, that all that interconnectedness is actually really hard to do when your whole game is about time travel because uh, there's sort of this paradoxical paradoxical <laughs> relationships like intrude on your gameplay. And so you have to try to make it as logical as you can, and you sort of, you sort of, we've made a lot of logical decisions up front about, about the way that time travel is going to behave in our game. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, I had to sort of keep some of the puzzle elements relatively simple because I couldn't have interacting elements because they would create paradoxes. If I had one object and I try to stack it on top of another object, and then you try to forecast what's going to happen in the future with those two objects, that becomes too complex, and while you could probably come up with some rules to sort of rationalize it, it wouldn't be intuitive to players, is what we were finding. So avoiding paradox in the in the puzzle design is probably one of the hardest things, while still having a, a nice, strong gradient of puzzle difficulty throughout the game. That's probably one of the biggest challenges. And John can speak to the narrative parts of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's on the narrative side and the puzzle side, like I was saying before, you know, for us, it's about, you know, integrity of the, of the product. We could cheat, you know, but it's, it's so much less satisfying when you, what we're hopeful is when someone experiences this, you know, when we release it, which is sort of indeterminate, but we're, you know, we're, we're gearing things up bit by bit here, but we, we just, we, we want someone to be able to play it and, and have everything logically work together. But as you, you know, maybe if, either if you replay it or just, you know, you take your time and you're really delving in and, and, and watching and listening and paying attention, there'll just be a lot of layers to it and all the way down. It'll make complete and total sense from, you know, from the puzzles and, and avoiding any time paradoxes to just the narrative components and some of the mysteries that we leave unanswered. But if you think hard enough about it, you might be able to piece together sort of the rationale for why the time travel is happening. There's, there's, there's some things answered, some things not. We're trying to make something impressive and beautiful with integrity. And it's, uh, yeah. it's a challenge, but it's so much fun. So much fun. Yeah, I can imagine it being a challenge. Yeah, it is. Have you seen the movie Primer, by chance? Primer, no. Uh, definitely check it out. It's a fun time travel movie. But uh, I, I would see that as an example of one where they play with the idea of time logic, but they, they, they do really button up every single hole. Yeah, as right. much as possible. I still think the best time travel related movie has to be Twelve Monkeys. Love that movie. It just blew my mind when I watched it, and then I had to try and describe it to my brother and had to draw pictures. It was, <laughs> it was pretty intense. <laughs> and so, when you're making these these puzzles, you've got on your website a little bit of a 
or on your blog, should I say, a little bit of a sort of what you can expect with puzzles. And you've got to move, move your cement block and you travel forward and back in time 24 hours. How did you make that? Like, at what point did you sit there and go, okay, I've got this time travel. How do you design a puzzle? Do you draw it out and just work it out in your head or on paper? Or what? It amazes me. Yeah, the very first one was a pure prototype. I, I had this idea really about that cement block idea that you're moving it back and forth and placing it in two positions in the past and the future and then sort of jumping between the two positions and time traveling while you're in the air. I had that idea just sort of all at once. I can't really remember what it was. As it turns out, that's actually a really difficult puzzle for, for someone who's just <laughs> joining in. I basically started the prototype with just that puzzle and threw it at a few people and they were totally baffled. You know, I, one or two people would solve it out of the 10 or so that I showed. And so I realized I'm going to have to back it out and sort of break down each of the mechanics of that, of that puzzle. And so I, a lot of the puzzles flowed from taking that one puzzle and breaking it down to its components so that it's actually solvable when you get to that puzzle. So that's like a good chunk of the beginning of the game. And then beyond that, I, I stuck down with a pencil and paper and a notebook, and I did it, did it old school, graph paper and, and drawing out the levels and sort of trying to break down each element of each puzzle. There's sort of these different elements of the time travel mechanic, and I tried to sort of introduce them one by one and then combine them slowly with all the various other mechanics that we have, like the standard platforms and moving boxes and that kind of thing. I'd like to go on record saying that, that I'm, I'm one of these several people who did solve it, although I will admit it took a fair amount of time. <laughs> I, I do like to feel that I... I, I, I'm proud of that accomplishment. You're so smart. Oh, man, thank you. <laughs> applause. You have a lot, an applause track? Play it. Play it right now, please. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll try and yeah, I'll get an applause track and, and put it down for you. I'm, I was reading about it going, it doesn't make sense. And then when it all sort of finishes, you go, oh, no, yeah, it, it does does make sense. And my, my sort of next question was about like adding the, the or dumbing down your levels. You know, how dumb do you have to go back? Like Paul, for example, I know you've, you've quoted that on your page a bit. They dumb the things down, but they're not too dumb. That's right. I was going to say, yeah, you don't want to make it dumb. I mean, you you want it to just sort of level up with an increasing difficulty. There's this really great breakdown of Portal. I can't can't give you the link right here, but it's they, they talk about in Portal how they sort of let, layer up the mechanics. And if you, if you look at it from a distance, it actually is pretty simplistic, but it feels challenging at the beginning because you've just... You've never interacted with that mechanic at all. And it's the same thing with a time travel mechanic is you sort of have to introduce them to the idea of time travel. And then there's a set of puzzles that are challenging once you're just introduced to that concept. And then you you master that and, and then you move on and there's actually more layers to this time travel. We have this notion that when you leave the past and go to the future and then you return to the past, you return to the exact moment that you left it. Um, and so there's a lot of little... There's a lot of little puzzles that rely on that mechanic, right? So there's there's this time freezing element as well. So you introduce that a little bit later on as well, but it's not something you want to throw at the user, at the at the player. Sorry, I'm talking as interaction designer here. That's <laughs> right. User, you know, it's not something you want to throw at the player like before they even understand what this time travel thing is. And so all the puzzles are challenging. It's not like you're dumbing it down. It's just that you sort of have to break it down into, into its components for it to be playable at all. Yeah, because you don't want to make it too dumb, but you don't want to make it too hard. Like when Metroid got re-released on the e-store, these kids were sitting there going, I don't know what to do, because there is no tutorial, so to put it. They don't, yeah, they don't hold your hand. Yep, exactly. No, and, we, and we're trying to, I mean, I, I talked about it already, but, you know, we're, we're trying to integrate the story into this thing, and so it's not just arbitrary either that these puzzles would start simple and get more complex. There's, there's The idea is something or someone is guiding you, so it, it, it feels like it all fits together and makes sense, and it's it's satisfying on that level. I like that Portal keeps coming up. I mean, we mentioned a couple of times, you brought it up, the, the you know, I, I like to tell people that we're trying to do for time what Portal did with space, you know, just like blow people's minds, but have it all actually make total sense within the uh, uh, sort of like the constraints we've created. And it, yeah, it's trippy stuff, but hopefully, hopefully people, you know, it'll be fun when people beat it. Someone will. Yeah. Well, like the thing, the good thing about Paul is it had that, that humor side to it as well. Are you going to try and introduce something like that to it? Or is yours a very straight cut sort of narrative? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's extremely human. I, I, I think that sort of all in the flavor of what you're trying to do, there's nothing wrong with any, any particular version of it. But we're, you know, we're, we're, we're still going to, you know, play test and sort of experiment. You know, Chad and I have been going back and forth on the, the narrative design, even this last week. It keeps sort of evolving and being reshaped, but it, it is, it is very driven by the, 
the character of Stuart, you know, the central, the player that you're uh, moving for most of the game. So the, the, the goal is to have a pretty rich story wrapped into it. So I, I would say, you know, I, I don't think of Portal as something that didn't have a rich story, but I, I think that ours has sort of maybe more uh, more texture to it, uh, you could say. I think that one uh, fun thing that we're doing without, I don't think it's revealing too much, but uh, we really think the character development is important. And so the character himself sort of undergoes physical changes as the game progresses. And so we actually put in the effort to get multiple models for the same character, just to sort of show his progression from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. It's kind of a unique thing you don't you don't see too often. It's so fun. I mean, we're contracting some of these things out and doing some of it ourselves, but it's fun how much work we've cut out for us, certainly, because it's... <laughs> It's, you know... Uh, Work smarter, not harder, isn't that the right way? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, something like that. So, just going on your, your level design and all your art and all that sort of stuff, I mean, the game itself looks beautiful. The the level design from your screenshots and that, it's it's going to be like, and you, you see the difference between past and future and all like how it's all decaying and all that sort of stuff. Where did you get the idea for that sort of art style? Like, did you design it yourself, or is there an, any specific inspiration behind it all? We're telling a story that starts off in the 80s, and so we wanted a really classic sci-fi look. That's Star Wars, that's Star Trek, Blade Runner, that's all those things in that, in that period that sort of establishes really classic sci-fi look. And so that was, that was the assumption going in. And then we, we had an awesome concept artist um, that we hired out a bit of work to do to sort of establish the mood. And so his name is Long Fam. And he did a ton of the work to sort of establish that mood, just given those parameters. And we based a lot of our models off of off of his work. And that, that's where that started. So when you say it's set in the 80s, I mean, most 80s movies, when they talk about the future, they talk about the future as in 2016 and we're on the moon and we've got big guns and we can teleport and all that sort of stuff. How far in the future are you going to go in your game? You know, it's funny because Chad and I, we, we, we've been tweaking it and adjusting it, and I, I don't want to give a specific date because it does shift a little bit, but I can tell you it's, it's far more than 50 years. It's, 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 it's a huge amount more than 50 years in the future. Awesome. So we're not going to look at it when we actually get to that date and go, huh. Right. Narratively, you keep trying not to have uh, any paradoxes there either. So, so we, we have rationale for how, how things would work future-wise, going as far forward as we do and, and the manner in which you do it. So there's not, there's no... There's no cause for concern there. Okay. So what have you got planned for the music of the game? Because there's obviously sort of a dark sort of game in some aspects of it. What sort of soundtrack are you going to look for? Something a bit metally or synth or something like that? Yeah, you know, synth is, synth is close. I mean, we have a, we have a couple of fellows who are uh, super talented. Um, we're, we're, I don't want to really sort of chat about their names just yet because we have yet to finalize all the, the contractual pieces. But they're they're both super talented guys, and um, yeah, you know we're, we're sort of we're sort of thinking, you know, we're working with multiple time periods here, so we're thinking something that is inspired by that sort of uh, '80s, you know, I guess you could say aesthetic for a sound, but that that sort of that sort of vibe. But then of course, yeah, but, when, you know, when you when you vault into the future, we, we're also going to do some really fun things with sound and, and music and, and audio that, that give you that sort of you know aural sense of just immense age and is you know. It just just as you're seeing the machinery and, and things break down and, and falter around you, you'll sort of feel it uh, and hear it as well from the soundtrack to the, to the effects. So um, it's sort of the inspiration and the direction we're taking it, yeah. Well, are you going to have a voice track, or is it going to be sort of a text sort of thing? No, it's, it's, it's deeply deeply voice. It's sort of a voice-text combo. We, we're, we're experimenting with a few a few techniques there. But, yeah, it'll, it'll be... Uh, I sometimes throw out the phrase like a radio play. We don't want to overwhelm the player, but it is tracking you the entire time. And it, it's something that we we're hoping it's pretty moving, you know, for, for the right person playing from beginning to end. It, it would feel like you were experiencing almost a movie-like sort of thing. Okay. So I've got to ask, obviously your game's based upon time travel and all that. If you could travel to any time period, what would it be and why? Ooh, Jonathan, that's a really good question. I I like it now a lot. <laughs> it's funny. People are always talking about like, oh, I go back to the you know the ancient past and I watch the pyramids get built, and I'm kind of like, no, no, no. We have healthcare and the internet and uh, you know lattes. I like it now. I suppose you know there's a lot of talk about uh, you know talking about the distant future. There's a lot of talk about uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence, and sort of where that's headed. And uh, I, you know, I suspect there'll be some amazing things that happen in all our lifetimes. But I do wonder, uh, you know, in, in 500 years, 
how much that will change and how much different the world will look then. So, I, you know, I suppose in general, realistically, I'd be more interested in going forward than back. I love the fact that you justified not going back because I don't have lattes. Oh, <laughs> terrible. I drink a lot of chab about John drinks a lot of coffee. lattes, so... From what I gather, a lot of New Yorkers just drink coffee. Do you, do you actually drink any other beverage, or is it just coffee and beer? No, it's it, well, I, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, espresso in the morning, uh, and then at night it's either a, a Merlot or uh, some sort of lager or a scotch. That's sort of the, that's my, that's my range. <laughs> so no water, orange juice. What's water? I mean, water just... makes play in there. That's <laughs> part of it. But, uh, you know. I suppose you get your water intake from your beer. Exactly. What you put in your coffee. It's part, yeah, it's, it's part of everything, you know. So, what about you, mate? What, um, Chad, what, what sort of era would you travel to? I'm going to ride a dinosaur. I mean, that's the question. <laughs> I don't want to stay there, but uh, you know, for a bit. <laughs> just uh, for a holiday. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. just make sure you don't do anything in one of those little um, primordial swamps. No, I don't want to far back. The, yeah. It would that's... affect one of the futures. <laughs> I was going to say, the butterfly effect. You're going you're gonna to screw with the rest of us. It'll be terrible. I'll come just before the meteor, so it'll be fine. Uh-huh. Right. So, right, so what's the future of Albatross then? Like, I mean, on your website you say sort of 2017. Is that just sort of a shot in the dark for now? Are you close to it? Or are you sort of, are you going to release a demo first? We've been talking and telling people, you know, we're about a year out. And we've been saying we're about a year out for the past while. <laughs> Three years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Clearly I misread the timeline earlier. Um, yeah, you know. Well, you I, I'm traveling back in time too much. I know, it's, that's right, that's right, i got to get my head back out of the clouds. It, you know, 2017 feels right, but, you know, we're going to release it when it's done and, and hopefully get a lot of death threats, just like, uh, you know, our friends, uh, No Man's Sky. <laughs> that's what we're shooting for. That's our goal. Yeah, I'd love to. not get death threats, that's a solid goal. To, to get yeah. them, yeah. No, we want them. Oh, yeah. to get them. We we them. We, all, all, all death threats are good death threats, so we're in. I suppose it means that people are actually invested in the game and, and really want it. That's right, yeah. exactly right. Look, gents, thanks... Thanks very much for, for coming on the pod. I wish you all the best of Albatross. I really am stoked to sort of have a go. It looks right up my street. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much, and uh, hopefully we'll chat to you again soon and sort of see where you're going and maybe get you on again to talk about the success of Albatross. Yeah, hopefully so. I hope it's sooner than a year, and I hope we're almost done by the time we talk again. Yes. If you haven't overdosed on coffee and now in like some kind of catatonic state where you can't move without coffee. Exactly. Yeah, can I just the, uh, can I plug the website just real quick? So it's uh, of course you can. Yeah, go for it. Uh, albatrossgame.com, a l b a t r o s s game.com. And if you guys want to follow Twitter, we got to that at at Deeper Magic Co, which is our studio's name. Come and say hi. Sign up for the news. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out because it is a solid looking game. So thanks again, gents, and uh, have a good thanks, one. Thanks, Lawrence. Have a good one. Thanks, man. Bye. So where did you get the name Deeper Magic Company? Because when I read that, I thought it was just like, because you've got it on your um, on your bios, you know, game designer, engineer, Deeper Magic Company. I thought it was just like a bit of a bit of a joke, like you're yeah. a magician or something. No, I know it's funny. It's it's, it's a reference to a, uh, a C.S. Lewis book, the uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Oh yeah. Yeah, where he's uh, there, there's uh, this whole thing with Aslan talking about there's a deeper magic sort of undergirding the universe. It sort of reflects a theme of our game. Just that there's sort of like, you know, rules and, and a system, a systemic sort of thing that went wrong, but a system of logic that governs what's going on. And it's sort of different and beyond what you can sort of perceive normally yeah, in right. real life. But it also, it sort of speaks to our, uh, we're, we're, we're both people of uh, like church going types. And uh, of course, C.S. Lewis is, uh, you know, he was an Anglican guy himself. And uh, so, you know, the. It has a kind of a resonance for us in a couple of levels, which uh, which we quite like. And um, you know, it's funny. It's so funny when you're launching something for the first time, where it's like uh, everyone does this, and it sort of I guess it makes sense because you want a studio that produces your product. But I sort of just want to talk about the name of the game as much as possible, and not be like, oh, it's the studio and the name of the other thing and the name of the other guys. And here's the t-, you know, it feels like a mouthful. All we really have to show for ourselves so far is this first product. But um, we hope down the line we'll have a couple of things. So with the name Albatross. Obviously, it's a, I don't know if you get that over here, but over in Australia, it's a bird? Yes, yes, sir. 
And um, actually, where I live, there's a, a rare sanctuary where you can't go anywhere near it. It's an island, and if you go near it, you get fined like fifty thousand dollars for going near it because this bird only lands once in its life, and that's where it lays its eggs. Yeah. So you're not allowed anywhere near it. Um, why did you pick that name? Um, well, just out of curiosity. Yeah, no, that's that 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 is part of it. It's so funny because Chad and I, you know, so it's, I, I think it's clear Chad's sort of the the engineer, and I'm more of a narrative storyteller guy yeah and it just popped into my head one day and we were fighting about uh you know fighting gently about what we were calling <laughs> loving, this. lovingly yeah lovingly lovingly sparring flirtingly yes okay lovingly sparring <laughs> beautiful yeah it just popped into my head and i wasn't really sure why but as i sort of was revising this, this section of the the, the, the narrative it just sort of made a lot of sense thematically because yeah there, there's that element of you know it's based on the actual animal and there's sort of a beauty there, and there's kind of this sort of sense of like, you know, it, it has this one chance to, to, to find happiness and sort of have a future. And then, of course, there's also, what do you call it, sort of, you know, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the idea of like sort of it's, it's, a, it's a weight around your neck. It's, a, it's a, you know, it's something as an albatross, meaning it's, it's sort of regret and, and uh, pain and, and, and uh, mistakes. And so it, it, we felt as though it had sort of a really fun paradoxical meaning all itself. The more you look into it, the more you can think of different things, like how albatrosses can fly on the wind without flapping their wings for so long, you know, and they can see the world with barely any effect on it, if that makes sense. They use the world to get where they want to be. Yep, exactly. Yeah, oh, it's, that's deep. It, it was fun because it was one of those... I, it, I almost feel like neither of us can take credit for it because it just popped into my head and Chad was like, oh, that does sound good, and so then we went with it. That's but yeah, upon further review, <laughs> it's... Oh, it's <laughs> it was more like, John, that's a terrible idea. We should stick with Time and Again, which is the great name. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. Chad did want it to be called Time and Again, which is fun. Absolutely. I think Albatross has a bit of a mystery to it. Yeah. It's funny because it's also really great in lists. Anything that starts with A is always nice. Um, and it's, 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 it's funny how, like, from, I, I mean, Chad and I, literally, we talked about this so much early on. It was like, we need our PR game to be on point. We need to be like really smart about just trying to push things out there and, and make it easy to find this. And it feels like that word coupled with this. It's, although it's funny, there was a dude who tried to make a game called Albatross a bunch of years ago that'll pop up occasionally on some databases. Although it's not, it's not particularly stunning. I would, I would offer, but <laughs> you know, is it hard working together? Obviously you being in New York and Chad being in Seattle. Does that not annoy, get frustrating, or are you constantly on Skype together? Or I think our roles are pretty well delineated, so that that helps quite a bit. John's able to work on the narrative without me mucking around in his files, and and, I, and I'm able to work in models and textures and code without him interrupting my workflow. So on that on that part, it's actually pretty easy. I mean, sure, it would be nice if we could be face to face and have more of that brainstorming time. Overall, I think it's it's actually been relatively surprisingly easy to do. Oh, uh, John, you can speak on your end. No, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty clear division of labor. It's it's fun because I mean, Chad is much more talented at the modeling and the you know he also has I mean, it, I mean he's giving long credit for a lot of the, the visuals, but Chad's a designer and, and a, 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 a talented artist in his own right. So it's you know I, I, I'm I'm able to do a tiny bit of modeling and then I'm able to like texture things you know, relatively reasonably well. So I, I'll, I'll hop in there from time to time. But um, yeah, you know, it's just an exercise in being very clear on what who's doing what at what time. And just, uh, we actually, Chad came up with the idea to have like a time log. So essentially we, we plug into this thing each each day, what we've worked on and how long we've worked at it. So it's kind of this nice, like, you know, it's inarguable that we're both putting in the time we're putting in, you know, down the road, we're hopeful that it sort of just keeps everything all even keel, really. But you're going to try and get greenlit or anything like that or you're going to try and kickstarter or anything or? yeah yeah hopefully both of those things is i mean we're still talking about sort of the timing and whatnot but that's yeah the thinking is kickstarter and uh, the greenlit thing of course yeah